This week, I interview Michael Laverty, who used to race for my team, Synetic BMW, and he is now the MotoGP pundit at BT Sport. He still races as well, and he's also raced in MotoGP, BSB, World Endurance, he's raced in America, he's got a lot of experience, so it's really interesting talking to him, talk about all his racing travels, and what it's like having racing brothers, because we're both in the same boat with that one. So, hope you enjoy this one, and I'll be back next week with, I'm not sure if it'll be Mad Mark next week, it might be. In case you're wondering why I've started wearing a hat, it's not because I don't pay my heating bill, it's because the lockdown hair is real. Hello. How are you doing? Sunny in, where are you at the minute? <laughs> Still on wheels. Oh yeah. <laughs> I struggle so bad with my, my connection in the house, so I thought I'm going to have to go outside and brave the rain, but it's not too bad. Actually. When you said you were outside, I thought, God, he's got the weather good in Wales, compared to England. <laughs> Obviously you've uh, raced in all sorts of championships, MotoGP, Moto America, as it's called now, uh, World Endurance. I just wanted to know if um, what your favourite championship was out of all of those. Um, it's a tough one. Probably BSB, to be fair. I really enjoyed the time in MotoGP, but you only really enjoy your racing when you're successful. And although it was successful enough for me personally, I always set my own personal targets, and if I achieved them, I knew I'd done a good job. But finishing 15th or 14th doesn't really yeah. uh, light anybody's fire. So probably being competitive in BSB when I was on good bikes like this one, Yamaha, Samsung, Honda, and the Tyco BMW, and the Relentless Suzuki, those were all potential race winning bikes and, and with good teams and working with good people. And that uh, against really competitive uh, competitors as well. You know, I spoke to Silvan Guntoli last week in an interview and he was saying about people underrate the level in, in BSB even now, the, you know, the level is so high, he was saying about, you know, there's 15 guys there, so if you're on a, a bad day in BSB, you can look very average in a hurry. So when I was there and I was able to win races and consistently finish on the podium, I knew that I had personally a lot of personal satisfaction and I knew I'd perform well and um, you always enjoy being successful. So probably racing, racing BSB ticked all those boxes. Yeah. What was your favourite season out of all the BSB seasons? Uh, 2011 on the Swan Yamaha because that was you've always got moments in your career when you get a bike that really works or that for me that was the most competitive package I ever had but it wasn't until um, Cadwell Park so it was only four or was that five rounds to go four rounds to go I think it was where we found a not a problem but a, a fix with the electronics for me at that time we were using a little bit too much Andy Wheelie and it was one of those things where you couldn't quite feel it I couldn't feel it but it was obviously a a lot of intrusion on the horsepower and once we we uh, basically switched that off and all of a sudden I went and put it in pole position at Cadwell Park and I won a race and finished second and then I went to Silverstone and put it on pole position and I uh, was on the podium and then I went to Donington uh, I just got picked for pole position and then I, at Brands I just got picked for pole position and I'm not a qualifier so it was just I got the bike working and all of a sudden I was actually fast as in qualifying as well as races so for me I had outright speed and and racecraft and I, I, I should have I, I kind of wish I'd have stayed put with the Swan Yamaha team that was a bit of a mistake to leave the rules were changing for the next season so it was a different bike anyway but at that time I, I had I had a bike a chassis a team and everything that worked for me and I had left so, because it was a, a few reasons but um, Tommy Hill had won the championship obviously at the end of 2011 and I felt over the last few rounds oh fair enough Tommy was a uh, much better position than me to win the championship but I was fast and I felt like I was always going to play second fiddle for Tommy so that was why I moved more than anything but uh, looking back I probably should have stayed put but it was um, it was one of those uh, purple patches in my career where it just clicked and it was a good bike and good team and, and I had fun It's hard when you change teams as well I always think it's like when you start a new school you're like your first day at your new school you don't know anyone you've got to learn you're still racing a motorbike at the same tracks, but the whole team side of it is a massive part of it as well. And when you've got a bit of continuity, it definitely helps, doesn't it? Yeah, it's it's amazing how long it actually takes for all that to settle in. You sometimes think, you know, after the, the pre-season testing and a couple of rounds, that's it, it's clicked. But it really does take, I, I reckon, a full season before everything sort of settles in where you're, if you've got a new crew chief where they understand what you want without having to say too much, um, even getting the bike dialed in to suit you and figuring out what you need, it does. It takes a lot of time. And BSB is a twelve-round championship. 
pre-season testing is always really interrupted if it's in the UK or we get a, a little bit of time in Spain, but then you come back to race round one and the temperature drop is 15 degrees and the bike doesn't work the same, so even that takes time. So there's a big uh, transition process when you change teams and change bikes that people underestimate. Some people do it faster than others and some people, uh, you know, slow burners get there and uh, it's a it's a huge part and something I've done quite a lot in my career. Jump, I jumped about a little bit too much perhaps and um, yeah, it's... There's a lot to be said for continuity, keeping the same bike and people around you. Yeah. And now you spend a lot of time in the MotoGP paddock, obviously with BT Sport. If you could, and you spend a lot of time in the garages as well, looking in, if you could ride for any of those teams, which one would you choose? Oh, teams is a tough one. Bikes, I would choose the Yamaha because it's user-friendly. It's quite easy to get on with. You can get to a pretty good level in a, in a shorter amount of time than perhaps, well, definitely on the Honda the Ducati looks a little bit more user friendly, but probably not just as easy to, to get on with as the Yamaha. So I'd probably choose the Petronas Yamaha garage rather than the than the factory Yamaha garage because when you're when you're in the factory team, obviously you have a huge amount of pressure. Whereas that Petronas garage has got some good people in there, Stiggy and Wilco, and the crew chiefs are, are clever and experienced and a lot of good staff. So I think it would be fun and a good bike, which is more or less the same as the the factory equipment. So I think. To tick all the boxes, to have fun, to be successful, to, to enjoy your race, and that would probably be the team to be in right now. And do you think out of everyone now that Quartararo is the only one that will take it to Marquez, or do you think there's anyone else could do it? I think right now that probably Quartararo and Vinales, if, if Maverick clicks and he can ride with the confidence, and you know, we've seen him do it on occasion, but he, he is... He said it himself, he's a little bit mentally fragile. So once he gets rattled a little bit, he's not as strong. Whereas at the moment, Fabio just seems to take everything in his stride. So he is the, the best bet, probably Quadraro. But I think if, if Maverick uh, can just, just line everything up, he can take the fight to Mark. But for anyone beating Mark at the moment over a full season, is it's a tough, t- tall order. I'm glad I don't have to race against it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what a nightmare. Imagine being his teammate. It just... Seeing his, seeing his dad and looking across the guards and he's always going faster than you yeah. it's so, so disheartening he doesn't really even when he has a bad day he still turns it around at the end of the weekend there's no yeah. no he's, he is unbelievable that, that's his, probably his biggest skill is when he's having a top week air and he's crashed and he's beat himself up and he's still grind out a race result I always thought Leon Haslam was a bit like that in BSB even when he was really struggling on top weekends I remember back in 2016 he qualified outside the top 10 and was struggling with the bike and all of a sudden he'd be standing on the podium on race day and that's that's what it's sometimes required being able to grind out a race result whenever the setup isn't quite there yeah um and then the other um championship you've raced in is world endurance you finished on the podium in Le Mans with Danny Webb and Christian Hidden I've never actually done an endurance race what's that like compared to racing in BSB or MotoGP I love endurance racing it, it sits me down to the ground it's quite I've always had a more of an economical riding style, more of a diesel kind of can go faster for longer. And that that um, when I first done World Endurance was 2012, I done a an eight hour for Honda at um, Qatar, and we got on the podium there. And then um, and then I was had a chance to race the 24 hours of Le Mans in 2014 with Brock Parks and Sheridan Morass for the Yacht Yamaha team. And again, we stuck at the podium despite a crash as well. So it just it, I had a lot of success every every time I raced an endurance race I was on the podium for quite a lot of races until I think it was Brock crashed out of one was um, was the first non-podium finish but it's a it's a different way of going racing I've done the Mon 24 hour last year for the first time slightly un, unprepared because um, usually I had I had rode a lot of bikes through the winter for BSB and done the ball in pre-season training camp so I was in good physical condition and I didn't find it that tough I, I always remember people saying about how how tough a 24 hour race is and I was dreading it when I first done it but then it actually didn't turn out too bad because it suited my riding style quite well but then when I went last season without a full winter's training behind me without a pre-season test and without a few BSB races under my belt I was quite uh, my, my, my body wasn't race fit and by 2 3 a.m. in the morning I was absolutely finished really the, 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 mind, the mind was willing but the body was weak and um, I just I, I got lucky somehow I got a second wind once the once the sun came up in the morning but Literally, my, my hip flexors had just sort of locked. They'd just gone from from gripping the tank and, and changing direction. You know, the, the way those hurt after your first weekend of riding after uh, after a winter off. Well, I I was doing I was doing eight <laughs> eight or nine BSB races back to back. You know, going consistently. So 
by the middle of the night, I went back to my motorhome and had a bit of a lie down and a stretch and had some food and actually bounced back and was okay. But it, it's, um, it is one of those, it's a tough sport because you have to be so consistent. You can't make any mistakes. So to win a race, um, you go through, uh, God knows how many people you lap, but passing traffic. So some most laps you're passing three and four people around Le Mans. So keeping your lap time within one second of your best lap time whilst passing people, that's the, that's the key and not doing a stupid pass where you cost yourself three or four seconds by running onto the grass. So doing that over 24 hours requires a lot of concentration and the same during the night when you're breaking up on people and you're using their brake lights as a, as a gauge and then they set, sort of blind you as you approach them and then you got to pull, pull in. But I got quite quite good at that if I blow my own trumpet. I always felt like every endurance race I've done, I felt like I've been one of the fastest guys on track, if not the fastest, especially when you look at my one-hour stints. I'll be within within a few tenths, even going through traffic, so that's what always made me quite quite good at it. And um, I still love it. I, I want to get back at it this year, all, all being well, if the dates work out where it doesn't clash with MotoGP and, and I can find a team, that's the other thing. It's hard for me to commit to a, a full season with all my other things going on, so um, trying to just work things out last minute to get involved with the team yeah um and then the other similarity that you have to me is that you've also got brothers that race motorbikes well i've yeah. i've only got one brother that i know of but um the the one question that i've got now i've got uh, mad mark as my dad <laughs> um, is did your dad used to pick sides like mine does he was quite good actually of, of uh, staying staying partial or <laughs> impartial so to say he was he ducked and dived between all three of our garages and uh, and I guess a little bit like Neil, whoever was more successful, he probably spent a bit more time in their garage, <laughs> but, um, but that, he was good. Whenever we, we started off um, as 125s in the British Championship together, he was our chief mechanic and then once we started in riding for professional teams, then he got a, a more relaxing side of, of racing so he could just turn up and, and enjoy, it, enjoy it, but leave us to it more than anything. So it was... It was quite, quite. Um, we learned he was an ex racer in Ireland, so we learned a lot from him. And then once we kind of um, got on our own way, just let us go, and he turned up and, and watched and enjoyed the sport. There's that transition bit, or we had a transition period anyway, where there was a couple of times where Dad would say something, and I'd go, "No, you're not right, actually, about that. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't an easy thing." <laughs> yeah, I remember that happening as well, where you kind of feel like you you surpass in terms of. Uh, your, your own experience you think you know better so, yeah yeah we got we got there I, I remember a few fallouts on the way my dad's quite placid and, and well he wasn't when he was younger so it was easier to rev up and you could have a few arguments over over a few things i remember i remember going to rockingham actually when we were still it was maybe the last full season of all three of us working um, out of the van so we i turned up with my super sport bike and blew the, blew the engine so i didn't have a super sport bike to race so i pulled my old 125 out of the out of the back of the van <laughs> So I had me, John, and Eugene racing one two fives, and Philip Moran, who uh, is now Top Rack's crew chief in, in World Superbike, he was he was our chief mechanic, but he had uh, broke his arm, so he didn't travel with us then. So it was just me and my dad looking after the three one two fives, and at that point, Eugene was hopeless, didn't do a whole lot. On <laughs> he, 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 he was keen to help out mechanically, but he didn't he didn't know what he was doing. But he was he was keen, whereas John wasn't so keen. He was the one who wanted to bluff off and walk away and not do anything. So. Um, the morning of the race, we had some. I can't remember what happened in morning warm up, but um, I, Eugene wanted his gearbox changed, so I was changing his gearbox. Uh, John had something else going on, but all three bikes were stripped, and uh, someone forgot to tighten the chain. Someone forgot something else. I turned up on the grid. My bike stopped in the grid. I qualified second, so I didn't even get the start. And then jo something happened. John's bike, and then Eugene's chain snapped on the last lap. So all three of us had DNFs because of our lack of mechanic. And, and I remember that driving back to the to the boat in Scotland that night, and nobody really speaking to me. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I got half the blame of it too, from memory. But it was it's a, it's funny looking back at it now. But it, <laughs> at the time, it was like you spent all the money traveling over there and uh, to run the bikes for the weekend, and not a single finish out of it. Out yeah. Of <laughs> I had a similar well it, it was similar in that we um, when there was the ash cloud in I don't know what year that was it was a long time ago uh, 2014 yeah 2013 well, even before that I think it was because I was still racing 125 it was like 2010 oh, I think yeah, it was there was that earlier one yeah. yeah and so we couldn't we were testing the rebel rookie bike and we needed to get back and we were flying back to race at Thruxton that weekend and there was no flights, so the only way to get back was in the hire car. So we drove 22 hours straight in the hire car with no sleep, no 
only stopping for fuel when we could. And just as I got there, we literally jumped out of the car, put my leathers on, went out. So we made it back, did practice, did qualify, and qualified fourth, I think. And uh, comes to the race day, and I just completely fluffed the start and went all the way back to last. <laughs> so we'd driven 22 hours all the way for me to fluff the start and get back. So that had an equal uh, welcoming response when I got back to the garage. <laughs> yeah, good old dads. Has they been hard on you through your career that way? We, I, I think our dad's much like yours. He's quite laid back, really. So yeah. when we were younger, there was, we, I've only ever had one fallout with him. Taz was more hot-tempered than I was when we were younger, so he used to smash the caravan up and stuff. It was more Taz that you had to watch out. <laughs> but, yeah, we only really had one fallout. Um, and no, he's been good since, obviously, now we're older and we, he lets us get on with it, really, and we do our own thing. But the one fallout we had was uh, not kill. My team manager at the time, Mark Keen, was basically revving me up to go faster and faster and faster. So free practice one at not kill, he'd rev me up that much. I went out of the pits like an idiot at however old I was. And I just kept running wide at turn one, nearly off the track three times in a row. Uh, on my side of the story, I was fastest at the time, so I thought there was nothing wrong with it. And um, about 10 laps in, I ran off at turn one at Knock Hill, down Duffer's dip, crashed at the bottom. I didn't know at the time, Dad was watching there and I landed at his feet. And his side of the story is, he looked at my mum and went, I'll deal with this. And stormed to the bottom of the hill and just gave me both barrels of it. Not happy at all. And that was our only real fallout, but we soon made up after that. It was funny. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, and then now obviously you... you doing less racing as you're traveling when you're doing the bt sport stuff i don't think sometimes people realize just how much traveling is involved in that and it's not not a case of just jumping on a plane sometimes what have you been to argentina you've been to argentina as a MotoGP gp presenter what's yeah. that trip like because of his well, stories it's um, it's 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 the toughest one it's the longest slog because there's no real direct flight so you got to get from Actually, last year we went was quite good. We went from London to Buenos Aires. Then you got to uh, get a flight from Buenos Aires to to one of the internal airports, and then from there uh, we got the the Dorna charter flight down. So last year was a bit of a breeze compared with when I'd been there. When we went the first year, uh, took took like forty something hours to get there, and we had to get a bus journey and everything as well. But actually, last year, I, like you say, people don't realise quite the travelling you do. I was in. Was I? I was in Thailand for MotoGP and then I was going to Argentina to the other circuit for World Superbike with Chaz. So I flew from Thailand uh, back to London, had a wait like, for 12 hours in the lounge and then flew on from there to Argentina. So I think I flew 40 or 36 hours in the air or something, but between stopovers and transfers, it, it was like it was way over two days of traveling to get to Argentina. Then there for four or five days and flew back to Japan. So the same route back to London and then London to Japan. But it, it was shorter distance-wise to go the other way around yeah. the world, but, uh, <laughs> but there was no, no flights to connect up that way, so I had to come all the way back to London. So uh, it's safe to say I swallowed a little bit of gin and slept through some of that on yeah. <laughs> the way on the flight. But, um, but yeah, that was, that was probably my toughest slog time-wise. But you get into, uh, for me, I actually just get into a mindset where I know what it's going to take time-wise. I've got my, all my downloads of series or movies that, sometimes squeeze in some work because I do a little bit of writing for MCN so maybe um, consider it, that'll take a five or six hour window to, to write something or do some work and once that's done hit the drink and uh, <laughs> watch some TV <laughs> and then you're sleeping for a few hours so and we're quite spoiled with BT Sport they do fly us business class everywhere so I've got a, got a lie down bed so I'm, I'm not complaining too much because yeah. it's, um, it's much actually I'm treated much better travel wise now as a pundit than I was when I raced so you've done it the, the cheapest way at times whenever you're paying for it yourself. And uh, so it's it's quite nice, that side of it. And I think some people burn out with travel if they have the wrong approach to it. If they get stressed, I'm completely relaxed and I'll be the last person on the flight. I'll just cruise up. I've never missed, I think I've missed one in my life, but I've never really missed too many flights. I'm always, know what I'm doing. I've been doing it long enough. So um, so there's a way to approach it, I think. And, and, and just it's part of the job. So you don't, don't get too annoyed about it. What's your favourite track to travel to as a pundit as opposed to being a racer? Yeah, that that was an interesting one last year to take in the, the fun side of going to a MotoGP event. So like the going to Mugello and being being there on the sidelines, taking the in the atmosphere, 
um, eating the good food, uh, enjoying the, the Italian beer at night, so all the things you can't do when you're racing. So um, thinking of my favourites, when I when I raced, actually, I used to love the American runs because back in 2013, we had um, we had three MotoGP. We had, we had Texas, Indianapolis, and Laguna Seca. So we had three trips to America, and they were all fun, and I managed to squeeze in a trip to Collins Boot Camp in between. Oh, wicked. Um, and those always had a Red Bull uh, after party on the Sunday night, so it was always it was quite good fun. So those ones, when I raced, were probably the most fun. Now, as a as a pundit, they're all they're all um, more fun than they should be. Sometimes we all have we have a, a, a good crack on the on the race weekends. Uh, generally, not too much to drink, so we're all uh, sort of happy. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll come come live TV the next morning, but it is it's nice to to be a pundit. I love the sport anyway, so to be there. In the best paddock in the world, um, traveling about, it's um, yeah, it's not a bad job. And obviously, we spend a bit of time with Neil Hodgson, and he loves it. It's like he's so gutted about Corona. Obviously, it's not good, <laughs> but just missing out on the crack he has at the rounds, I think he he loves it. He misses that so much. Yeah, that that's the nice thing about it. So with Neil and Gav and, and Keith and, and Susie and all the crew on the the cameramen, the sound men and um, everyone we have, we have a really good crew there. We do have, have fun going out for out for food and, and a few drinks at, at night. And um, yeah, I think when you're in the paddock uh, when you're younger and you're um, serious and the whole weekend's a pressure situation, so you never never really are able to relax. So it's nice to be back in that environment but um, but being able to look at everybody else and you know that sit full of nerves and you're not you're just you're just uh, enjoying it so it is it is good fun and, and like me I'm missing it as well yeah oh, wicked well we'll wrap it up there Michael thanks for that no worries thank you very Top much alright well. yeah I'll speak to you soon well then alright cheers, cheers Michael see you in a bit bye bye that's another episode of Mac Chat finished if you enjoyed the episode please subscribe to my channel and like the video I'll be back soon bye for now